In today's episode, Sue and I discuss how yoga has changed my life, why in the world am I dressed like Alex Hermosi, and also why in the world does Sue not enjoy country music. Make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, leave us a review on your favorite listening platform, and we'll catch you guys on the inside. How many outfits do you wear per day? I could wear the same outfit like three days in a row, honestly. <laughs> so how many times do you think you change per day? If I'm training, at least once. Yeah. But I would say probably once to twice on average. Only twice? Yeah. I know you change like 17 times a day. No, 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 That's no, no. why our laundry is insane. Our laundry is insane. And, and it always dawns on me when I do all of it. Like I normally... You do some of it, I do some of it. And so it doesn't seem like all that much, but this weekend was one where it just ended up that I did all of it. And I did five loads of laundry. We do laundry every week. I did five loads of laundry. Now, four of them were clothes, full loads. I'm not talking, you know, we're not, I don't have, that's, I'm going too far there. But um, <laughs> one of them was towels, four of them were clothes. And it was literally just from the week. I was amazed. And, and when it's all I, your clothes. <laughs> and when I put clothes in the dirty clothes, either this morning or yesterday morning, the hamper is almost full again. Not now. I, I did laundry again yesterday. Oh, dang. So, so I did another load yesterday because I, I saw the same thing you did. And I was like, we are not doing this because we've got to travel this weekend. But I was, I was saying for the amount of outfits that I wear is a minimum of three. Yes. Because I, I have an outfit that I start working in. And then I, with how much time I spend on camera, I start not liking how it looks. I'm like, yes, I don't really, I don't really like this. So then normally that turns into me training anyway. So then I change into my training clothes. And then by the evening, I've got a different outfit on. Cause again, I'm back on camera and I want to have a different look. So three outfits plus, you know, whatever I'm wearing at night. So maybe four. <laughs> I saw a like reel or TikTok or something. And it was saying, uh, how many pairs of underwear, like these girls packed for travel and they were gone for, let's say nine days. And one girl packed like 20 pairs or something of underwear. And it's kind of that concept of when you travel, you're like, oh my gosh, anything could happen. So I need extras. But for you, I feel like honestly, you do wear like three pairs of underwear a day. At least two. Yeah. At least two. I, I, I feel very prone to swamp ass in it. <laughs> I really do. I don't know what it, I don't know if it's just a male thing or it's just something that I've been unfortunately gifted with genetically. Gifted. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just something I would like to avoid. I, I, I do not, I do not want to have that be the case. I, I appreciate that. You're welcome. And I save us laundry because I just don't even wear bras or underwear. So I'm really helping us out. You're such a free spirit. And then I, <laughs> then I see you just flowing around in these uh, t-shirts and sweatpants, no underwear, no bra, and just you know, frolicking through the world. And I'm like, I would like to do that. You, you can just can't do, do that. that as a male. You can't. You just can't. You can't. Well, as a female, you can't do it once you get to a certain, like, as far as like not wearing a bra, there's definitely places. I, I feel like that line is, is over. Like people, people don't care. No, people, trust me, people care. If your titties are down fly, in baby. the by your stomach, people I mean, care. That's, that's a little bit of a problem. That's what I'm saying. Do we tell the story of when I was on the plane to Las Vegas? I mean, go for it. So I was flying to Las Vegas to spend some time with friends. And I had the privilege of being seated by a woman who had six very small children with her. And these children seemed to age anywhere between newborn to four years old, probably. And all of them were breastfeeding. <laughs> all of them were breastfeeding. And it was such an interesting experience to sit there. And I got nothing wrong with it. Do whatever you need to do. Now, I will say that this woman was a little bit larger and there was personal space was being invaded. Um, but that was a interesting overall experience. Oh, I remember the text coming from that flight. I was blown away. I, I, <laughs> it was a it was a direct flight from Columbus to Las Vegas. It was an extremely long flight. I packed in. I think that was the last time that I flew Southwest. I think that was like one of the only times you've really flown alone since we've met. Yeah, probably. Not the most pleasant experience. No, I don't fly well without you, honestly. <laughs> 
I'm very, I'm very codependent on you when it comes to flying. Well, it's okay. I'm codependent on you when it comes to other things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we talked about just the other week as far as you getting started with yoga, but we were out on our patio. And if you've been listening for a while, you know, we love just sitting and chatting on our patio. It's something really important for us to have quality time together to finish off the night. Uh, I actually was looking up today how long the average couple spends together. And it's two and a half hours per day, but that's including the weekends. And they had broken down to like 30 minutes of that is eating a meal, 30 minutes of that is um, doing housework together. And then the rest of the time on average is like watching TV together. And I feel like that's something we've really put into place of having that time to just sit and talk without TVs, because we could be together all day, but not really having that quality time. So I thought that was just interesting in general. But uh, we were talking about just kind of the impact of yoga, because it was after you had gotten back from a, a late night class, and we were just chatting about the, the whole experience. Yeah, yoga has been a really fun experience for me. It has been something where I have learned a lot about myself and getting into the experience as a whole, it has given me something to work towards, a goal and and seeing progress and all those different factors. And it came at a period in my life that was so timely, uh, timely in the sense of I have been resistance training very, very consistently for over a decade. I have been coaching for near a decade and it was a, a time where we were very overloaded within the business and I wasn't taking any specific courses that were, I was learning new material or I was being challenged in a different way with, with new material. And so it was a period in my life that, and, and I was, it was unbeknownst to me because everything was moving so quickly. And I made the decision to jump into yoga, not even necessarily with the intent of having something to work towards, but it just felt right. It felt like something I should try and it felt uncomfortable and I was nervous and all those different factors. And I was able to um, really see progress and get obsessed with seeing the progress. And uh, that's you know what we'll dig into today, but really uh, finding something that has really pushed me forward and challenged me on a week to week basis and something I'm finding a lot of enjoyment in. I love the enjoyment that you're finding in it. It's been fun also to do some of it together as well as with Miguel, my sister joining. Um, we've been able to meet some people through yoga as well, which has been just a really positive experience. But I do have a question for you. Uh, within yoga, obviously, I had been doing yoga beforehand and I had talked to you and you even had talked to your clients about the benefits of doing yoga. And I honestly nagged you a little bit of you should go and do yoga. I think it's going to be really positive for you. And it just never was the right time, which I understand within different points of your life, there's times where you really see yourself ready to commit to a change. So I understand that side of it. But with you knowing the benefits and hearing me talk about the benefits, understanding them yourself, what outside of just like, oh, it feels right to commit was holding you back from experiencing those benefits? I would say my unwilling nature to not be good at something. I would say that I am a, I am looked at as an expert within the space because of the work that I've put in and those different factors. And so I have kind of hung my hat on that. And if you get too caught up in feeling as though that that's your identity, then you find yourself in a situation where you're very unwilling to put yourself out there. And so I, I've had periods in my life where that was a sport that was baseball. That was, I wanted to only do baseball because I knew that I was very good at it and I was getting praise for it. And so I didn't want to go against the grain, if you will, and have a situation where I was not the best or, or one of the best at something. And so this was kind of one of those periods where I pushed myself to, um, get into a, a phase of life that pushed me into that scenario. And so that was probably the thing that held me back the most was just not being good at it. 
I ask that because we also had a similar situation come up with my sister. Of uh, She has been getting into uh, really being able to learn about food and be able to have enough food throughout the day. And she, I've always told her of, hey, you need to eat more and eat more throughout the day and you're going to feel a lot better. Make sure you have water throughout the day. And she's obviously heard that from other people as well. And it wasn't until she did it and she was like, you'll never guess. I feel so much better having water and eating more. I have more energy. My mood's more stable. And I, for a second, wanted to pull out my hair because I'm like, am I just falling on deaf ears? I'm telling these people the magic that they can be experiencing, but they're not really understanding it until they're able to get into it. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that whole aspect because I know we've experienced it with different people in our lives and then ourselves as well for different uh, aspects like something like yoga. Yeah, I think that there's a component in which the person just has to be ready to receive it. You can say it as much as you want, but that person has to be in a place where they're willing to take that next step. Like you can, I know that for myself, I am very unwilling to do anything that I don't want to do. And so you can tell me all the things that I should do and all those different factors, but I've got to burn through all of the other options that I have made up in my head that are other ways that I could go about said thing. And I have to go through all that. And then I can be like, okay, I get it. I should probably try something else. Did you ever doubt the benefits that you had heard about yoga or just think like, oh, they really can't be that good or it's probably not that much of an experience? It was just never something that I was pushed towards doing. Uh, There was dynamic stretching that I would do prior to training, but there was never really a time that I spent a whole lot of time doing mobility work. And and I realize now and in hindsight, how much it could have benefited me to do these things when I was, was playing sports, because we did some general static stretching, some general dynamic stretching prior to uh, practice and games and all those different things. But even then that doesn't really suffice. Like you need to be doing stuff on your own time and, and um, working on your overall mobility. Cause I'm also just not a naturally mobile person. Like I, I'm very tight in, in nature, especially at this time of my life where I'm spending a large portion of my day sitting at my desk. Even if I'm getting eight to 10,000 steps, I'm getting my training every day. I'm still sitting at my desk a very large portion of the time that I'm awake. And so the reality is, is that I have to, to get out there and spend more time directly doing things because for the individual who's not sitting at a desk every day, uh, you know, five, six days a week, they may not be as tight as I am, but especially through my hips and everything, it is paramount that I get in and, and have those few hours a week where I'm getting into deeper stretches, holding different poses and, and those different factors. It's been really helpful for me because I honestly, I'm going to skip out on stretching a big portion of the time. I think stretching is really boring. I know it's very necessary, but I find it very boring and tedious. But yoga allows me to have a flow of a few movements that I can do on my own and feel good in those. And then, of course, in the classes, really having that dedicated time, I'm going in here to stretch, for lack of a better uh, description of what yoga is. So it's been really helpful for my mobility with that as well. So you mentioned that you are not naturally a very limber person or a very flexible person and said that you wish that you were doing this earlier on. What have been the benefits that you found from yoga in regards to like your mobility, your lifting, your strength, your recovery, and just how you feel on a day-to-day basis? Okay. So this is, that was a lot. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll start with the benefits that I've experienced from a physical standpoint. So I would say that the aches and pains that I've thought that I was just going to deal with for the rest of my life from previous injuries, um, those different things, those have been alleviated just through my hips, through my lower back, through my knees, through my ankles. Those things have already almost been completely gone, if not already completely gone. And so that's been the the biggest thing. I just feel more uh, loose. I, I don't feel like I'm carrying as much tension through my body. The other is that my spine 
feels like it moves properly. I feel as though that with my spine previously, it was kind of just a steel rod. And it's hilarious because with clients, I would use that cue of, of treating your spine as a steel rod through your hip thrust or, or through your RDL and, and keeping things in a neutral uh, spinal positioning. And, uh, you know, having taught it so much, I was embodying it fully. <laughs> and so now having the greater mobility and, and rotation and, and uh, I would say also strength, um, having greatly improved and then kind of moving me into my strength, this has allowed for my range of motion within a lot of my exercises to be much greater and range of motion with tension being on the tissue. Because I think that this is uh, very different. You can have an active range of motion as well as a passive range of motion. So I, I could push into a greater range of motion previously, but in terms of that tension being placed on the muscle, it was very slim. It would just be displaced onto the joint because my body was not in a place to take that tissue under that length under tension. It just wasn't apt to do it. And so now being in a position where I can do that, my strength has improved as well as just the functionality through exercises and some of the things that I was kind of working around within my training because of different ailments and previous injuries, a, a lot of that has has left. And so that, that's the other thing is that for those who are listening who are former athletes, this is something that I learned from my physical therapist, James Fryer, um, who I also will accidentally call James Clear, the author. I don't know why <laughs> I accidentally screw up his last name all the time. James Fryer here in Columbus, he is a, an incredibly intelligent human and has been a huge help to me. I've only had maybe three or four sessions with him, but uh, something that he has taught me is that with athletes, you just learn how to compensate because you're mm -hmm. having to keep moving through the sport and, and all those different things. So athletes are hyper compensators in, in terms of injuries and it being kind of a trickle down effect and all those and all those different factors. And so he has helped me abundantly as well. It's it's yoga. I'm I'm more frequently doing yoga than going to see him. I see him biweekly. And uh, but he's helped me tremendously as well. And so navigating through some of those previous injuries, uh, functionality of the tissue as well as my strength being better. Recovery is an interesting part. I'm not so sure that my recovery is better quite yet. I'm still kind of in a spot where getting my steps up alongside having two hours of pretty challenging yoga, training legs twice a week, it's a little tough, you know, recovery wise. Like I, I wouldn't say that my recovery has improved. I would say that I, well, if I wasn't doing the yoga and I was hitting my steps and I was training legs, I'd probably be in a worse spot. I, so I would say that in that scenario, apples to apples, I, I would say that my recovery has improved. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. I have just noticed so much more pep in your step uh, because you... It's fun to be able to feel your body move in that way. And it's been really special to see you just going through the house or on our walks and being like, look what I can do now or look where I can reach. Uh, and it's just your body truly moving because you have had, you've been in sports your whole entire life and lifting included in that. And then being in a spot where you've had a lot of injuries that have just kind of, you've healed around them. Um, and we've talked about of just, I want to go and get a full body scan and them to tell me everything that is going on within my body. And it's been cool to see a lot of that alleviated by being able to work into the yoga and the PT, which I love that you brought up the PT because with PT, it's a lot of very small movements that you're doing. You're not doing these huge extravagant workouts. You're doing very small ones that are very easy to skip. They're, they kind of can seem really tedious. So within your experience within PT, and how small those are, how do you keep yourself doing those very small kind of they seem, oh, what's the even point of doing these things uh, when you're you're so busy throughout the week? Well, I think that finding time in my schedule to 
make it frictionless is the biggest thing. So doing it before my training sessions has been the easiest time for me to do it. And then doing it in the evenings when we're kind of just lounging around is another easy time for me to work them in. Cause it's not that it's like a, a set, I have set exercises that I need to do, but it's not that I have to do them all together. So I'll, I'll do maybe, I have four to five exercises that I need to do on a day-to-day basis. I'll do maybe two or three of them before my training and then maybe two or three of them when I'm getting ready for bed type situation. And the biggest thing that I have taken from my time with James, there's a, a handful, but the first one is going to be my breathing. My breathing was a, a big issue going in there. And and he spoke to their, you know, with having put on, putting on so much muscle tissue. And I'm not saying that I'm Jay Cutler. I know that for those who have listened to the podcast, I've wanted to, to be Jay Cutler since I was very young, but having started lifting when I was 130 pounds to now being close to 220 pounds, I'm on my way down um, <laughs> through this dieting phase. And so having put on near a hundred pounds in that in that time window, my rib cage has not functioned properly in this time to allow for me to breathe and and those different aspects for quite some time. It was a very rigid positioning, which is great from a bracing perspective within resistance training. A lot of these things that we're talking about are like, this is good for what you were doing. Like this was, (laughs) you needed your spine to, to not function properly to a degree, right? And then you needed to have the ability to brace and be able to have all that tension be stored. And so a lot of these things were great for what I was doing, but also realizing for longevity, as well as me feeling optimal and all those different things, uh, these were, these were very important. And so getting my rib cage to contract and expand properly as my lungs are bringing in air and, and exhaling air um, has been huge because I was dealing with a lot of tension headaches. I was dealing with a lot of just like my shoulders being shrugged up. And that's, I, I think, in combination to both of them. I think that him taking me through a lot of these ways for me to improve my my rib cage function as well as my breathing alongside going through the yoga and um, working through thoracic extension and, and those different factors. Like uh, there's one pose that really sticks out to me within yoga where we're leaning back with our, we're standing and then we're trying to lean back with our upper upper body and bend at the spine and go into thoracic extension. I wish I had a video when I first started doing it because I I didn't know what to do. I saw people doing it and I just was like leaning back, but my body was like, <laughs> bro, just <laughs> my from my waist to my head, it was just one piece. I was not having any like curvature to me. Mm-hmm. And so now I actually have some extension that I feel there and I can feel my my chest opening up. I can feel my spine lengthening um, or I guess flexing. Mm-hmm. I always get that mixed up. But um, yeah, so a, a lot of, I don't even remember what the original question was. I've been babbling for so long, but it's been a, a big benefit. But with those PT exercises, I think it would be oh, yeah. really easy to just be like, oh, these are kind of like small. They're really not that important. And so I know for you, because you knew you were committing to PT, and especially because you really respect James, it was, I'm going to commit to doing these. And if I do all of them and still I'm not feeling how I need to, then we assess from there. But it wasn't uh, I don't know, these really don't seem that important and just not doing it. And the reason I bring that up is just within coaching, we really talk about how you need to pay attention to some of those small things. And a lot of people think, oh, should I be intermittent fasting? Should I be doing hit or list? Should I be doing all of these different things when it's really, hey, can you nail down the basics to make sure that you're able to build upon that and see that success? And I'm just really proud of you for committing to it because I know with all things PD, PT, it's so easy to skip out on it because they seem so small and remedial. Well, this is a a cheat code for anyone out there who's trying to step into something that you've been wanting to do, but you found every excuse not to, is that pairing yourself with someone that you greatly respect and, and something that is going to be a financial commitment for you, those are the two best things that you can do for yourself to really commit. Because it's like, if you respect that person, you're not going to let that person down. 
And then if you've put in enough money to where it's a little bit uncomfortable for you, you're really not going to let that person down. Mm -hmm. And you're really going to give it absolutely everything you have because you don't want to get to the end of this and let down someone who you had a lot of respect for and an opportunity to build a relationship and build that respect equally from both parties because that's a really cool opportunity. So you've lost out on the possibility of that as well as wasted your money. Like that is, is silly to me. Um, so both of those things are enough weight for me to, those are my two things that I try anytime I'm trying to do something, that's what I put into place. Um, and, and yoga was very similar when I first got started. And we can talk about some of the different components that I had, you know, what has changed from when I first started to what I've experienced now. And one of the things when I first started was that I, I felt like a little bit of an outsider there. And I wanted to prove to them that I was not there just to, you know, do it one time or be there two times. Like I wanted to prove to them that I was, I was there to get better. And I was there to improve at yoga and learn from them. I was not there to, um, you know, make, make fun. Cause I was, I stuck out kind of like a sore thumb in terms of my body mass and, and structure relative to the other individuals who were doing yoga. That's not a, you know, a toot of my horn. That's just yeah. the reality of the situation. And so that was another situation where in terms of respect, I wanted to gain their respect for being there. And that was enough for me alongside the financial commitment to go to the classes and so on that kept me, kept me going alongside other factors in terms of like, I wanted to get better. I, I, I felt the benefit. I felt the challenge that I wanted to really uh, throw myself into. And so if if you're trying to get yourself into a new vertical of things, finding someone that you respect that can guide you and finding someone who charges a fee that makes you a little bit uncomfortable is a good idea. I completely agree. And something that you did with starting off is you bought like a 10 class package because you had decided I'm first not going to waste this money because that's not how I roll. But I also am committing to at least doing these 10 to 12 classes, whatever that commitment was, because you had talked about previously when it came to whether it was yoga or another venture of you might try it for one to two times and then get discouraged. So what were those first one to two classes? one to five classes like for you? So I love sweating. I love heat. So going to a hot yoga class was very up my alley. That first class, and and I went in with the intention that I wanted to relax. I wanted to be able to be present and relax. And I can assure you that my first class was everything but that. I was pouring sweat, <laughs> pouring sweat. I had- I, I, Slipping on his mat and everything. I was embarrassed by how much I sweat. <laughs> Um, I, my heart rate was through the roof. It was uh, my, my aura ring was tracking it basically as a hit workout. I mean, it was ridiculous. <laughs> so that being said, I was pouring sweat. My heart rate was very high. I felt like my head was pounding because I'm going through, I'm up, I'm down, I'm, I'm all over the place. And it was very challenging. I was very out of breath and I, you know, they're telling us to breathe and I'm like, I'm trying to just survive here. <laughs> let alone breathe. I hope I breathe, but I have no idea on focusing on my breathing. And so to, you know, transform or to be 10, 11 weeks into being consistently going now, maybe even three months, I'm not sure. But now like my aura ring, I have to let my aura ring know I was at yoga because I am in, in a much more rested state. It's still a challenge. I'm not saying I'm Mr. Yogi over here. <laughs> Uh, but I'm a lot better than I was. I'll tell you that. Sure. And um, yeah, in terms of emotion that I experienced within that first class, I was very self-conscious. It was very easy for me to be like, people are looking at me, people are making fun of me, people are making their own, um, you know, they're they're developing their own notion of me without knowing who I am. And I didn't like that thought. And I really had to silence that thinking because the reality is, is that, at now that I'm th three months into going consistently, there's never been a time that I was ever looking at anyone else in the class. So why in that moment did I feel as though every single person in the class was just watching me? 
Be, and, and that's in every scenario. Like that's when someone goes to the gym for the first time. That's when you're going to the first day of college, all these different things that happens. And, and I was able to make, connect the dots there because of how many people I've helped work through that situation, as well as how many times I've been there too. And so it's easy to recognize and say, okay, this is, this is not reality. I'm fabricating this in my head. Just calm down and focus on going at your own pace here. There's no reason to get worked up. There's no reason to get self-conscious. There's no reason to get anxious. Just go through the class. And I had to remind myself of that for probably the first month or so. And I really had to be cognizant of it. But the first time that I saw progress and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm getting a little bit better. Like I'm better than I was. That's when things started to click for me of, oh, now I'm, I'm enjoying this because I assure you those first couple classes, I did not enjoy it. It was, I got my ass kicked the whole time <laughs> and felt like I, cause it, the, the classes that I started with were at night. And so I was hoping my initial intent with going to these classes was I was going to have like this, this stretch, relaxed, hot yoga. I'd come home, I'd have this cold ass shower and I would go right to bed. That was my thought. And that first month I did not do that. My central nervous system was on overdrive Red line. and I would come home, I'd eat, I'd shower and I would just sit there. Cause I, my body was like, bro, we are not ready to just go to sleep right now. We need to calm down. We need to like actually do some yoga now <laughs> to relax. And so that first month was challenging. Cause then I was, I don't know if I'm going to keep going. Cause I don't want to keep hindering my sleep. Cause I'm just sitting here for you know two or three hours. Like, I don't know what to do. My body's not calming down. And so uh, I got past that and, you know, just continuing to work through small details and get better at it was the awesome part. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. And with your first few classes, you had to be watching the instructor a majority of the time, yeah. which is something that I wasn't taking into account because I had gone to yoga. And while I couldn't just name off all of the names of the poses off the top of my head, I know a lot of the common names and the actual names from just hearing them repetitively and kind of knowing what flow someone's going to go into. And I remember leaving a class and being like, oh, that was so nice. I just closed my eyes eyes and like flowed through the whole practice. And you were like, eyes closed. There's no freaking way. I was literally trying to see the instructor the whole time, which I think is, again, a really important part of you just saying you went there to be relaxed and to have this experience of all these positives you had heard from yoga. And then you were really feeling the opposite. And I think that's with literally anything or any new skill or hobby that you're learning. In the beginning, it's not going to be this like beautiful experience where you're just like flowing into it. It's you're figuring out what you're doing. And that's going to take some time to adjust to until you get into the flow. And it's the same thing, I think, within like eating a certain way or lifting is when I first started to figure out food, I was like, People are lying about liking this kind of food. Healthy food is not good, and I do not enjoy it. And I was feeling like I was just eating to look a certain way. And then I started to figure out, oh, if I put these things together, or this is what I enjoy, and this is how I can really make it come to be. But it definitely did not start off that way at all. There was a lot of really bad food that I ate to get to that point. And I think people just want to skip over that a lot of the times because they hear and see the benefits, but that beginning hard part is kind of hard to get over. Well, it makes sense that they want want to skip over. It's not mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Like, I don't think that anyone desires to, that that's more often why people put, continue to put it off and make excuses as to why they don't do it is because of that initial friction that that's there until they get into whatever flow state that they can find within whatever task that it is. And sometimes it takes a little bit more time than others to get into the thing. And maybe you try the thing and you never actually find the flow state. And that may be that's exactly what you were trying to learn is that that's just not for you. You don't necessarily enjoy that thing. Even if your friends enjoy it and all these different things, it may just not be for you and that's okay. And something that I, I want to make a note of is that when you're in that beginning phase, the, the window of time in which you are like, man, I'm never going to get better at this. That window is 
much smaller. And then the, there's much more frequent moments of, I'm getting so much better. I enjoy this. This is great. I'm doing so good. Those are, are very small windows. As you have more time doing these things, these windows elongate because you just don't have as much progress to make. And so when I look at myself from a resistance training perspective, my gaps are much bigger. And so, and, and it's very easy to be year 12, year 13 of, of training and not even celebrate those small victories. Cause it's like, finally, bro, you yeah. finally added five pounds here, five, 10 pounds here. Thank goodness you finally did it. Let's get back to work type situation. And you don't even recognize it. But in this initial phase, I've got a lot of celebrations. Cause I'm like, damn, bro, I can stand on one foot mm -hmm. for an entire time. Like I can, I don't have to reset or, or do those things. I can celebrate that every time that it happens. And so in these phases, it is a, it is paramount that you celebrate these no matter how small the victory is, you take time to really recognize and celebrate these things because there's going to be a time as you continue to be consistent with it, that they're just not as consistent. And you're going to wish that you were back in the situation where they were as consistent. And so really being present in the moment is so, so, so important because I've been kicking myself that I wasn't documenting more of this initial phase. I wish I, and I was telling Miguel this while we were training is that I wish I had the video of me going through my first class. I do too. Like, I wish I would just set up a camera and told the class like, yo, I know this is ridiculous. I know these, this camera here on the tripod while you guys are doing your thing, but I need to have this for my own documentation. Like that would have been perfect. Uh, but I didn't do that. <laughs> and so, um, as I talked about, I was already feeling self-conscious. Can you imagine putting a camera out in front Well, that's of exactly it is a lot of times we don't video ourselves when things things aren't as good. And then when we go back to compare progress, it's like, I really haven't made that much progress. I was thinking this even within the dieting series of a lot of the days I didn't feel good in my body. I don't have videos or pictures of those days. And so when I was trying to explain to someone how I was feeling or how I was looking, I couldn't find how to show them because I didn't even take pictures during that time. And so I think it is so important to look at it and see this is a, a step in this journey or in this experience, and it's okay if I'm not the best at it right now, but especially for something like yoga, even if you weren't going to do it at the class, you could have come home, set up a camera, and gotten a few of your poses, but you likely didn't want to showcase yourself not being great at something, uh, which is very understandable as we talked about within the Perfectionism podcast. Um but within the yoga, one point I wanted to touch on is within starting it, like we said, it was quite an adjustment to get into it, but you also had to adjust to how it fit into your schedule, which is another barrier I feel like people hit when they're starting something new is they try it once or twice and it doesn't really fit into their schedule or into their routine, or maybe they don't like the instructor or the type of class. And so they're like, I'm not going to go back to that. And I would love for you to talk through kind of what you did with starting at the studio that we did to really nail down and what mindset you went into with that as well. So I was very fortunate for the first class that I picked was a home run. It was my, my, still my favorite instructor. I don't, that was a, a God universe thing. I don't know what it was, but that's what it was. And so I was lucky on that side. And then I said, okay, sh she only teaches, I think, four classes and two of them are back to back when I go. And then they're like the next morning, I, I don't want to do that. So I needed to find another instructor. And so I just went to every other hot yoga class that they had with every other instructor who taught it. And the, the following two were big misses. One was a lovely individual was a little bit too stoned. I'm not, I'm not tripping I'm on, not on you smoking before you go, to, go into class, having a nice edible, do your thing. It's your life. You are teaching the class. So there may be a little bit of greater coherence that you need to have, but Hey, do your thing was a little too stoned. And then she was banging rap music. And it's just like, when I'm doing yoga, I'm not trying to listen to Cardi B talking about clapping cheeks and everything. It's just not really what I'm looking for. <laughs> so that was a miss. And then I went to another individual again, lovely individual, but it was more of like a gossip circle. It was kind of like a mom's, I was the only male in the class and it was a kind of a mom's 
round table of what's going on with the kids. So they kind of talked through the whole hour class. Again, not really my vibe. And then I found the individual that um, we go to now consistently, and she is an amazing teacher. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, you know, just working through and kind of finding those was a, a great experience for me. I was able to uh, take roll with the punches of the classes that I was not thrilled with of just still learning and trying to work on what I can work on, uh, knowing that I was not going to go back to the classes that they, that they had taught or what have you, and just moving on to the next person. Um, but just going into it with open arms and not getting too worked up because I think that you put me at whatever age and I'm probably sitting there pouting of like, I don't like this teacher. This sucks. I don't, I don't want to be here, blah, 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 blah. And I, didn't do that. I, I, I had my knee jerk reaction was to act that way of, I took, I took the time out. I drove over here. I I'm here at this class. I paid for the class obviously. And this isn't what I want. Blah, blah, blah. I, I could have complained very easily, but I just opted not to. And, uh, it was, it was, uh, very helpful. I love that you took that attitude because, again, like I said, it can happen with any skill or hobby. It can be with lifting or anything that you just need to figure out how it works for you and what really matches your schedule and your lifestyle. And I had tried a few different instructors without you and with you as well that I wasn't the hugest fan of. They were great human beings, of course, but it just wasn't my fit. And I did start to get a little discouraged of, am I going to find a yoga student? studio here that I like because the teacher can make or break the class for me personally. And just being able to be committed to, I'm going to give this a true shot and I'm going to try these different teachers and see which one is a fit and also a fit to my schedule, which I'm just so glad you did because you could have, I remember that hip or uh, the hip hop, one. hip hop, like rap music one where, and it was a late night class where you were trying to relax and they're just blaring hip hop. And when you call called me or we saw each other afterwards, I was like, oh my gosh, I would not be surprised if he didn't go back. And then you just kept trying things, which I think is just such a testament to really committing to give something a chance. Because you weren't committing to, I'm 100% going to be a yogi at this studio and I'm going to do yoga for forever. It was, I'm giving yoga a fair shot. And that means giving it maybe three months, trying the different instructors, trying the different types of classes that they offer at different times and really seeing, hey, does this work for me? Because I love that you mentioned earlier, there's things that like my friends love that I really just don't love. And that's completely okay as long as I still support their love for it and allow them to love it and not talk poorly about it because there's absolutely no reason to. But it's okay if you don't like something, but truly being able to give it a fair shot if you're going to get into it instead of just kind of writing it off once you get started. Like your disliking of country music? I've given that a fair shot, trust. Have you? I gave it a shot for like 18 years of my life. Not long enough. Guys, she's given up on country music. Can't find a single song. It, it, <sighs> what music do you guys listen to when it is beautiful outside? The the grills grills going. You've got people over. You, everybody's hanging out on the patio, having a great time, having a beer, doing their thing. The sun is blazing, but it's not too hot. And what music are you supposed to listen to? Not country. Sue says vibey tunes. Mike. Mike can be played at any time, but it's probably time for some country. It just fits the vibe of what's I going on. I let you play country and I don't complain well, about it. No, no, no. Then you There's... ask me, oh, do you like that? Because I didn't complain. See, and then I tell you, honestly, wasn't my favorite, but I, I knew that you were enjoying it. See, there's this thing called silent complaining. And <laughs> we have we have gotten this telepathic connection that I don't need to hear you complain. I already know you're complaining. Well, that telepathic connection ain't strong enough. There's times <laughs> where I'm trying to tell you something. <laughs> or on the I contrary, need to. Mon Frere, mm. I certainly know when you're complaining. I can look over at you and be like, yep, I need to change this song. That's your own perception. Anyway, back to my yoga journey. <laughs> um, oh, my God. What else do the people want to know about um, this? Well, I think that you had mentioned it previous, but just wanting to improve at something. And we had talked about that of just in life, what you feel like you're really connected to is being able to kind of get new skills and just 
experience that improvement, which I think is such a noble thing to to want to acquire because there's so much difficulty in, quote, starting over and starting at the ground level of something that you do not know how to do. But I love that you're always wanting to acquire and learn how to do new things. And I think it really allows you to improve in so many other aspects of your life by wanting to learn those new habits or skills. Uh, and it's just something really admirable. Yeah, I think that it's just important to have one thing in your life at all times that you're actively working towards getting better at. And and at there are seasons where that can be your job. And, and it, that could be the only thing because that is truly the, the demands of what you have going on in your life at the time. And then there are other seasons where you're able to have multiple things that you're actively making progress in. And, and I think that this also speaks to having a body composition goal consistently, whatever, however big or however small is important. It doesn't mean that you need to be in a contest prep or in a um, very serious bulk and you're pushing calories tenfold, but there needs to be checkpoints that you're working towards and benchmarks that are in place so that you can really push forward because it's very unlikely that you're just going to go through your training and go through your nutrition and all these different things of, well, I'm just, I'm just doing it. And it's like, well, what are you, what are you trying to do? And although you may be great at the things that you're doing, whether that be training, whether that be nutrition, am I talking to myself? I don't know. But in that, it's like you can say these different things and you can be great at them, but not having something that you're actively working towards really limits you in terms of the progress that you can make. And it's more likely that you stay in a state of stagnation without something that you're actively working towards. And so having at least one thing in your life that you have that's challenging you as well as you're excited to see progression in, I think is is really, really important. I 100% agree. And I'm such a believer that success doesn't happen by accident. It happens with intention and being able to have a goal that you are intentional about to get there. You And within the word success, that doesn't just mean maybe what first came to mind of being rich and successful or being like, I don't know who who else I'm thinking about within success as a whole, but success can mean whatever you truly see as being successful. And maybe that's um, the, the family that you've built or the friendships that you've built or the legacy you're going to leave behind. It could be anything as far as how you gauge what success is, but none of that happens without intention in your life of working towards something, having a goal in place. And you could just go through all of life with without really like having any checkpoints or anything to measure yourself by and you kind of get to the end of life and it's like what what all happened here really not a lot and i love that you've taught me so much about having that intention um and being able to dig into why am i doing this what is my point of doing this and what is the intention i'm taking towards doing this to really just be able to have more fulfillment within life as a whole I'm sure that as you guys are listening to this, you can think about the people that you're surrounded with or your family or what have you and think about the individuals who are really taking intention to their day and those who are just aimlessly going about their day on a day-to-day basis and have no actual intent. It's just, well, I woke up and I, I had to go to work and then I had to eat, so I just ate and then I had to do this and now I'm going to bed. It's like, what are you doing, bro? Like there, there's so much more to life that you can enjoy and find purpose within that is going to make your life significantly greater if you just make the choice to do so. It's literally a matter of, of making the choice and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be things that are financially driven. I think that that's really important as well is that the first instinct is like, I don't have the money to invest into anything. And it's like, no, no, no. This literally could just be you doing a better job of, keeping your shit cleaned up around the house. Like that could be the thing that you need to work on. And you're all of a sudden you get eight weeks down the road and it's like, my kitchen has been clean for eight straight weeks. Like I've, I've done a good job of this. I've kept my room clean for this amount of time. That doesn't cost you anything. Honestly, that's probably making you money by not being so flustered in your head. And so 
uh, I think that that's something where it can be as small as you need it to be, but building momentum is really important. And that's something that this has done for me is that I've been able to go from yoga and physical therapy and continue my education within overall gut health and, and all those things. Like it's, it's steamrolled into other things and will continue to steamroll into other things as long as I decide to continue to take that momentum forward. And so that's the biggest thing that I would, I would take from this episode is just taking action, even if it's the messiest action in the world, you just need to take that first step and move towards something that you're excited to make progression in. And there's so much to be said about your self-esteem and your confidence being built by being able to overcome challenges. And when it comes to learning something new, it allows you to really build more like neuroplasticity within your brain so that you can not only age better, but you can have more creativity, learn more things, build new pathways to really be able to grow into a different person. Because those who are lackadaisical and aimless and not having any direction or intention within their life, I can tell you they're likely not building those new pathways and really learning new things, seeing things from a different point of view. So I think there's such power in just being able to commit to something and do it if if not only for your own self-confidence and self-esteem to show you that you can to be able to see how capable more things can be for yourself. I agree. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share about the yoga journey for me? I don't believe so. The last thing that I'm just now realizing as I uh, look down is that I'm on my Alex Hermosi fit. <laughs> a little bit less muscle, not as long of a beard, not as long of hair, but this is an Alex Hermosi fit. I've got the tank. I've got the uh, flannel. So swag. Look at you. If you guys are not subscribed to the channel, I, I don't know what you're doing with your life. If you are listening to us on your favorite listening platform, please leave us a review and maybe, well, I guess you're not seeing this, so you, you can't rate my Alex Hermosi fit, I suppose, <laughs> but have a beautiful day. We appreciate you all abundantly. Thank you for listening. See ya. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.